Welcome to RGA Actual. Today we're in Harlem, a city close to Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and we're actually in a prison that was built in the early 1900s. It's a wonderful story of transformation and sustainability. What was once a prison is now a mixed-use space consisting of a university and co-working spaces. Today I'll be speaking with Olaf Kaper, Global Chief Client Officer, and Matt Battersby, Chief Behavioral Scientist for RGA. Welcome. Olaf, to kick us off, tell us about the importance of sustainability at RGA. You just told us where we are. We are in the cupel. It's, it's a prison. And in short, I think the whole ESG, we cannot escape. We have to deal with it. And, and Matt, uh, well, welcome to, to the Netherlands and, and to Harlem. Tell us a little bit about you know, the work that you do at RGA. You've got a global role, so you see a lot of things. Um, what exactly does your team get up to? Yeah, so the key thing that we, we need to remember is that human behavior is messy. Um, you don't need to be a behavioral scientist, Jackie, to know that, okay? We see that in our, in our daily lives. Every day we see people acting in surprising or seemingly irrational ways. The challenge is that it's hard to design for messy. Our job and our role within RGA, but most importantly with our clients, is to help them design products, policies, communications, based on how people really do think and behave, rather than how we think they should think and behave, or even how we would hope yes. they think and behave. And I guess your, your work really spans the value chain, doesn't it? I personally believe there is no better industry to work in as a behavioural scientist than life and health insurance. Um, a, because it's we make such an impact, it's such a positive force in society. But B, because it's really hard. I sometimes describe myself as a sprout seller. You know, sprouts are good for you, you know they're good for you, but they just don't taste very nice. Life and health insurance is good for you, you probably know it's good for you, but it just doesn't taste very nice. If we were, were perfectly rational, then the, the protection gap wouldn't be as large as it is. I mean, there was a, a recent survey in the UK where it says, of the people surveyed, only around 53% of people have protection. There's almost in, in every continent, there is a large underserved groups of people. Matt just made me realize that my grandmother would have been an excellent life and health salesperson because she just forced me to eat sprouts. <laughs> <laughs> Look where we are, right? It's, it's, it's a transformed prison into a education and co-working space with all those self-employed people working here. Are we offering them relevant protection products? The, the other thing is Google a beachfront in 1970 and Google the same beachfront in 2022. Compare those pictures. You, you, you will see the next pandemic. So, same question as for the co-workers. Are we offering relevant products for those groups? And maybe Matt can comment on that. I completely agree. We need to create relevant products, but we also need to create meaningful products. Exactly. We have to remember that buying life insurance is not natural human behavior. If you ask the behavioral scientist to design a product that most went against natural human behavior, it would look a lot like life insurance. You know, we're, we're all motivated by immediate, certain personal rewards. Life insurance is not immediate, hopefully. It's not certain, depending on the product, uh, and it's not personal. It goes to someone else. It's a hard product to sell. So we have to make it meaningful. But meaningful for me means two things. It means bringing the emotion into our products. Why do you need this product? You have to awaken the need. And often that is emotions that you need to tap into to do that. But second, and I think this is a really key point, we have to focus on what is meaningful to our customer rather than what we think should be meaningful to our customer. This point about emotion is really key. I mean, maybe you can give an example of, of some of the, the, the some of the things you've seen in that space. Yeah, I mean, an example of that is cancer-only products. Why are products like that often more successful than general products? It's because cancer 
is a motive. Yeah. It's easy to imagine getting cancer. It's easy to remember someone you know getting cancer. So it's more available. It feels more risky than other things that may be more riskier, but you just don't remember or recall. Absolutely, in quite it's the same more way. tangible. It's it's like when you arrive at the at the airport. You know, in Japan they have these these kiosks where you can buy travel insurance priced at maybe 10, 20 times the actual risk rate. That's really interesting because um, life insurance used to be sold in airports. I've, I've seen pictures in the, in the US um, from decades ago where there would be kiosks where you could buy life insurance at an airport. Why, why is that? Well, because the risk was very available. Yes. Then. If I'm about to get on a plane and particularly in those days when the risk of flying was very clear for people, then that suddenly just awakened their need for insurance. Now, I don't think that's the way we'd want to go now, but it does make that point that there are, there are moments in time, often, that make a risk more available to you. If you open any newspaper today, there's something on the environment. There's something about climate change, quite emotive often. What are the things you've seen that are, are quite interesting from an environmental perspective within? Yeah. Yeah, so sustainability is the biggest challenge that behavioural science is, is, is going to face. I mean, just as the world is going to face. You're asking people to make sacrifices which have some benefit to them, but more importantly, have benefit to others. Actually, I think there's a real opportunity to help shape positive climate action related behaviour through life insurance products. If you look at the, the four biggest um, non-communicable disease risks. It's smoking, drinking, poor exercise, poor diet. Okay. If you can encourage someone to reduce their smoking, there will be a direct environmental impact as well. Getting someone to improve their diet doesn't necessarily have an environmental impact unless you link it to something like reducing red meat consumption. Getting to the heart of how customers think, um, you guys run some really interesting experiments. Maybe you can give an example of one or two of the experiments that you've run We've just been running some experiments in Australia with close to two and a half thousand participants and found that by taking a behaviourally enhanced approach, we were able to increase comprehension of a quote and a product by 50%. The next thing to test is does comprehension truly impact acceptance and take up of a product? Earlier, uh, we, we spoke about the digital customer journey, Matt, that is really the key puzzle to solve for, for many, many insurers. Could you shine a light on that a little bit? We've run a huge number of experiments uh, on this, about 10 different countries, 30,000 participants, testing ways to improve the customer journey. And the key thing is, is that yes, we want better disclosures. You know, we want more honest and accurate disclosures, but we also want a quicker and simpler uh, and more positive customer journey. Now, sometimes I think we feel that you can only have one or the other, that there's a trade-off. You have better disclosures or you have a better customer journey. What we found through our experimentation and applying our insights is that you can actually have both. An example of this would be, we've just been testing some uh, revised smoking questions at the moment. As we know, um, asking about someone's tobacco consumption is one of the most important questions that we ask. Uh, and what we found is that by tweaking the way the question is asked, we can increase disclosure by about 5%, and we're only increasing the length of that customer journey by two seconds. Yeah. So two seconds increase in length for 5% increase in disclosure. If a question is phrased well, in a way that makes it simple to answer, even if it takes a little bit longer, often respondents think it's quicker because mentally it's easier for them to do. Matt, so some key takeaways from our discussion today. Yeah, I think the key thing for me is we have to recognize that changing human behavior is hard, but changing behavior is important. We're already in a privileged position in this industry where we influence so much. We have the real opportunity now to do even more. Absolutely, to do even and responsibility effectively. Responsibility for our policyholders, but also for wider society. Um, and I think we have a real opportunity that we need to grasp, to take on and think, okay, what else can we do to improve the society in which we live? Thanks, Matt. And for you, Olaf, um, a couple of closing remarks. We're doing the right things. People can read that in, in our ESG report, but we have to do 
much more and much better as a company and as an industry, especially on the S. There are so many underserved markets where we can provide, uh, to what Matt said, we can provide people with good solutions, a healthier lifestyle, etc., etc. And I think that is the big task, if you like, challenge for the coming years. Thank you, Olaf. Very good points. And thank you, Matt. Thank you, viewers. Thanks for watching our discussion today and see you next time. <music>